I was again on the road, again at the wheel of the old blue sedan, again alone. Rita had been dead to the world when I read that letter and fought the mountains of agony it raised within me. I glanced at her as she smiled in her sleep and had kissed her on her moist brow and had left her forever with a note of tender adieu which I taped to her navel, otherwise she might not have found it. Alone, did I say, partout à fait. I had my little black chum with me, and as soon as I reached the secluded spot, I rehearsed Mr. Richard F. Schiller's violent death. I had found a very old and very dirty grey sweater of mine in the back of the car, and this I hung up on a branch in a speechless glade, which I had reached by a wood road from the now remote highway. The carrying out of the sentence was a little marred by what seemed to me a certain stiffness in the play of the trigger, and I wondered if I should get some oil for the mysterious thing, but decided I had no time to spare. Back into the car went the old dead sweater, now with additional perforations, and having reloaded warm chum, I continued my journey. The letter was dated September 18th, 1952, this was September 22nd, and the address she gave was General Delivery, Colmont. Not VA, not PA, not 10. And not Colmont, anyway, I have camouflaged everything, my love. Inquiries showed this to be a small industrial community some 800 miles from New York City. At first I planned to drive all day and all night, but then thought better of it and rested for a couple of hours around dawn in a motor court room a few miles before reaching the town. I had made up my mind that the fiend, this Schiller, had been a car salesman who had perhaps got to know my Lolita by giving her a ride in Beardsley the day her bike blew a tire on the way to Miss Emperor, and that he had got into some trouble since then. The corpse of the executed sweater, no matter how I changed its contours as it lay on the back seat of the car, had kept revealing various outlines pertaining to Trap Schiller, the grossness and obscene bonhomie of his body, and to counteract this taste of coarse corruption, I resolved to make myself especially handsome and smart as I pressed home the nipple of my alarm clock before it exploded on the set hour of 6 a.m. Then, with the stern and romantic care of a gentleman about to fight a duel, I checked the arrangement of my papers, bathed and perfumed my delicate body, shaved my face and chest, selected a silk shirt and clean drawers, pulled on transparent taupe socks and congratulated myself for having with me in my trunk some very exquisite clothes, a waistcoat with nacreous buttons, for instance, a pale cashmere tie, and so on. I was not able, alas, to hold my breakfast, but dismissed that physicality as a trivial contretemps, wiped my mouth with a gossamer handkerchief produced from my sleeve, and with a blue block of ice for heart, a pill on my tongue, and solid death in my hip pocket, I stepped neatly into a telephone booth in Colmont, ah, 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 said its little door, and rang up the only Schiller, Paul, furniture to be found in the battered book. Horse Paul told me he did know a Richard, the son of a cousin of his, and his address was, let me see, 10 Killer Street. I'm not going very far for my pseudonyms. Ah, 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 said the little door. At 10 Killer Street, a tenement house, I interviewed a number of dejected old people and two long-haired, strawberry-blonde, incredibly grubby nymphettes. Rather abstractedly, just for the heck of it, the ancient beast in me was casting about for some lightly-clad child I might hold against me for a minute after the killing was over and nothing mattered any more and everything was allowed. Yes, Dick Skiller had lived there, but had moved when he married. Nobody knew his address. They might know at the store said a bass voice from an open manhole near which I happened to be standing with the two thin-armed, barefoot little girls and their dim grandmothers. I entered the wrong store, and a wary old negro shook his head even before I could ask anything. I crossed over to a bleak grocery, and there, summoned by a customer at my request, a woman's voice from some wooden abyss in the floor, the manhole's counterpart, cried out, Hunter Road, last house. Hunter Road was miles away in an even more dismal district, all dump and ditch and wormy vegetable garden and shack and grey drizzle and red mud and several smoking stacks in the distance. I stopped at the last house, a clapboard shack with two or three similar ones further away from the road and a waste of withered weeds all around. Sounds of hammering came from behind the house and for several minutes I sat quite still in my old car 
old and frail, at the end of my journey, at my grey goal. Finis, my friends, Finis, my fiends. The time was around two. My pulse was forty one minute and one hundred the next. The drizzle crepitated against the hood of the car. My gun had migrated to my right trouser pocket. A nondescript cur came out from behind the house, stopped in surprise, and started good-naturedly woof-woofing at me, his eyes slit, his shaggy belly all muddy, and then walked about a little and woofed once more. <laughs>